Hello and welcome to Unheard, I'm Freddie Sayers. It's sometimes said of people that they had a seat on the front row of history. Well, our guest today, that is definitely true of. Her name is Fiona Hill, and she has been closely involved in matters to do with Russia and Ukraine, advising American administrations for many years. She was born in the northeast of England, in Bishop's Auckland, and went via universities in the US to become a senior intelligence analyst, serving under both George W. Bush and then Barack Obama. After a spell at the Brookings Institute, where she now has returned to, she became, in 2017, the deputy assistant to President Donald Trump and senior director for European and Russian affairs on his National Security Council. So she was advising President Trump about all matters, Russia, Ukraine, and the wider Eurasian area. Famously, now, she gave explosive evidence against President Trump at his impeachment trial concerning the Ukraine scandal. And she most recently has produced a number of books, including one on the mind of Vladimir Putin, called Operative in the Kremlin, and most recently a look at deprived post-industrial areas, such as the northeast of England, and what can be done about them. So a storied and long career, and welcome to the show, Fiona. Thank you very much, Freddie. It's great to be with you. There are so many things that we could talk about. Obviously, the particular area of history and geopolitics that you are one of the world experts on, which is Ukraine, Russia, particularly from a US angle, has now become the centre of everyone's attention. And you were there for many of those key decisions. So I thought we might start a bit chronologically. Obviously, we can't start right at the beginning. But one period that is often talked about when people argue about the origins of the standoff uh, is the kind of NATO expansion um, that happened, well, in the early 2000s and subsequently. In 2008, when there was that Bucharest summit, when George W. Bush was president, you were advising him on, on Russia. And that was the summit where NATO said that Ukraine and Georgia will become members. Um, what were you advising at the time? Well, look, there's a lot of complexity of all of this issue. And as you said, you know, uh, it's difficult to know where to start. And, you know, wherever people pick a point in history uh, of this actually tends to kind of frame what they think about it. Now, 2008, uh, with the open door that was offered to Georgia and Ukraine at the April Bucharest summit, um, was actually pretty much of a low point in the, the long chronology of all of this. Um, as you are sort of suggesting uh, with the framing of the question, it was actually a pretty bad idea uh, to give uh, Georgia and Ukraine uh, an open door to NATO. But it was perhaps not the reasons that everybody is immediately thinking about, which is that the whole expansion of NATO uh, was uh, generally a bad idea. Because what was happening in 2008, uh, and you mentioned there was a kind of a larger expansion of uh, NATO in the 2000s, was that uh, the members of NATO, when they were gathered uh, for that summit, were trying to suddenly address a very late request from Georgia and Ukraine for a membership action plan to NATO, which wasn't membership immediately into NATO, but was uh, Ukraine and Georgia asking to be considered over time as a member. Now, that's a long, drawn-out process. When countries apply, it's not automatic. Some of them can kind of you know, stay in, under consideration for a long period of time. And not only were the majority of NATO members opposed to this at the time, but it was also not particularly popular inside of Ukraine itself. This was very much an elite project driven by uh, the president of uh, Ukraine at that uh, particular juncture, Mr. Yushchenko, and then also the Georgians, where there was actually much more support for NATO membership because of the tensions in their relationship with Russia. It was very much a result of being driven by security concerns with Russia. So wh why did it happen then? I mean, if the, I mean, I don't know whether it's right or wrong, but people tend to feel like those moves were unnecessary at the time. And it sounds like you would agree with that. Yeah, what, we, what... I and uh, other people around us, we actually uh, basically said, not a good idea at all. We should thought it shouldn't have even been under consideration in Bucharest. So you said that to George, George W. Bush's administration? We did. And, you know, there are uh, many other people. Bill Burns, who's now the director of the CIA, for example, um, he had uh, been the ambassador in Moscow. He'd written against it. I mean, part of the reason was that it wasn't going to succeed. 
uh, they were not going to get a membership action plan. And membership action plan is not membership of NATO. So there's a question about how to guarantee their security. So what you had um, as a result of a kind of a diplomatic contretemps in, um, in Bucharest at the time was a decision to say, OK, you're not going to get into NATO now, but you will at some point in the future, which again was a, a bit of a precedent break. And that kind of meant it was the worst it was the worst of all worlds in terms of an outcome. It was Angela Merkel who helped to kind of broker that uh, of Germany, and she was actually opposed to Germ to Georgia and Ukraine getting into NATO at that particular juncture. And what happened was, you know, they were told one day, sometime in a very distant, God knows when future, but in the meantime, you're on your own. And of course, that was basically like a red flag to a bull for Vladimir Putin, who had been opposed to uh, Georgia and Ukraine seeking NATO entry. But I have to say before we go on, Freddie, though, that this isn't the full that this isn't the full story. Because NATO has become over time a kind of a red herring in many respects. It's the thing that everybody looks at. But Vladimir Putin and many of the people around him, going back to the 1990s, before NATO expansion was even a thing anywhere, and when he wasn't even in the presidency of, of Russia, but back in the 1990s when he was working in the mayor's office in St. Petersburg, was part of a group of people who thought the Soviet Union should never have collapsed, Ukraine shouldn't be an independent country, and was of the view that the Soviet Union should be put back together in some way territorially. So his views about Ukraine are not shaped by NATO early on. I just want to say that, that NATO becomes a fixation, but it's because he already believes that the Soviet Union shouldn't have come apart and that Ukraine, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Moldova, you know, you name it, of all the other uh, independent countries that emerged out of the Soviet Union should be in Russia's orbit, either directly back within the territory of the Russian Federation or under its control. So NATO is a means for countries like Ukraine and Georgia to pull away. But it's already coming after years in which people like Putin have been, you know, basically stewing in this idea of grievance that the Soviet Union had come um, apart in the first place. So I guess the question, the, the broader question there is, if you take as if you accept the fact that Putin had some kind of expansionist um, dreams, at least, if not hardcore plans, back, even stemming back to the 90s and romanticized the lost Soviet Union and the rest of it, if we, if we just accept that, do you think that the Western missteps is a legitimate kind of line of inquiry in terms of understanding how we got here, like what you consider to be a mistake in 2008, maybe also how the 2014 Maidan revolution was handled? Is it fair? It's become hotly political now and you get kind of slammed if you say anything that sounds sort of nuanced. But is it is it fair to, to, to accept that the, the West could have handled things better? Uh, yes, the West could have and should have handled things better. But perhaps, again, not in the thrust of where the debate has been going, because we should have been thinking about how we were going to ensure the security of all of Europe, not just those countries that were in NATO. And of course, the European Union was kind of talking about, you know, security issues in 1994, again, before there was the expansion of NATO, which doesn't you know, happen until 1997. The United States and the United Kingdom gave assurances to Ukraine of its territorial integrity, independence and sovereignty when Ukraine, Kazakhstan and Belarus were pushed to give up nuclear weapons. But we never had any plan for their security. So part of the issue is we always have looked at Russia as the only successor state of both the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. It's the last empire in Europe. And all the other countries have had contingent sovereignty. So we've tended to think that none of the other countries really have the same interests and the same rights, and that Russia still has a sphere of influence. And that's where our problem has been all the way along. So we've always sold short the sovereignty of all the other countries that emerged out of the Soviet Union. We call them the near abroad the newly independent states, the Commonwealth of Independent States, and then there was always Russia. And all of my titles when I was in government were Russia and, Russia and Eurasia, Russia and this, Russia and that. All of our framing uh, for all of the um, programs and think tanks was always Russia and something else. So we've always thought as Russia as having a dominant role. And if you think about Britain, we never thought that about England doesn't have a right you know, to dominate over India still. The Commonwealth for the British Commonwealth is not much of anything apart from sporting events and cultural issues. And, you know, was the Queen, but maybe not the royal family in the future. Russia is unique in the fact that we still recognize it as having this dominance 
in a huge swath of, of Europe. And so we didn't reconceptualize European security. And it was a mistake to think that NATO was going to be it. We should have probably been thinking about a whole host of other European security arrangements, including how to deal with Russia and how to engage Russia over the longer term, because we relied on the fact back in the 90s that Boris Yeltsin didn't have imperial aims. But when you get people like Putin, it becomes evident over time, not, not immediately, but evident over time that Putin has aspirations for not just making Russia great again, but for making Russia great in its neighborhood. And that shifts around 2007 or so. We've got the Munich Security Conference actually going on as you and I are, are talking. Uh, but you know, if you look back to 2007, Putin makes a pretty explosive speech at the Munich Security Conference, in which it's kind of no more Mr. Nice Guy, Russia's back on the stage. And we do not like the unipolar world that we have with US dominance, and we want to ex exert our rights again. But look, this is now the third great power conflict in Europe in a century. The United Kingdom is now forced to intervene, just like the United States is, as in you know, World War I and World War II. UK didn't start World War I, UK didn't start World War II. It was Germany you know, invading uh, in the first instance, you know, France uh, by way of the Low Countries in World War I and in World War II, uh, expanding east into Poland and, you know, further on. So we're kind of in the same position, whether we like it or not. And we're, we're there for the same reasons of being inattentive to the security risks in this region. And so now we're forced to care, you know, where we should have actually been more careful and attentive in the past, including on how we handled 2008. It's quite sobering to hear you call it a great power conflict akin to World War One and World War Two. You, you're not using the phrase World War Three, but it, it seems like... I've been like... avoiding that because I've, I've used that before and people thought I meant nuclear Armageddon, but right. I really meant this. But, yeah. but if it is potentially a, a conflict of the same kind of stature, what can we do to help reduce it or to help avoid that outcome. And so this fast forwards us now to the present day. We've had the invasion. We've had Western support for Ukraine. They have repelled us as far as they can. And we've now, we're now at what looks like a bit of a um, stable battle line between Ukraine and Russia. What do you think should happen next from the Western point of view? We need to have an international diplomatic effort. We need to persuade the rest of the world that this war is not in anyone's interests. And that's where it becomes difficult. Because as you're suggesting, and I think all of us feel, this can't just keep going on on the battlefield. You know, if we look at those other wars, which is, you know, why I use this analogy uh, and, you know, these very similarities, because those ground on forever until there was, you know, some decisive moment on the battlefield. We might not get that. Even though, you know, people talk about it all the time and, you know, there's lots of military experts talking about, well, how much military equipment would Ukraine need to turn the tide or... What can Russia do to, you know, keep things in place? We need to have a a, a full-on international diplomatic work effort where everybody thinks takes of this seriously to push you, uh, not Ukraine, uh, but Russia towards the negotiating table. So does that mean because you're I'm against the the kind of just arms being the only thing that's really talked about? Because that's what it feels like the attitude at the moment is in the West. That the question is only should we send jets? Should we send more long-range missiles? Whatever. There isn't any talk of peace negotiations. Well, there is talk of peace negotiations, but the problem is that the Russians are not interested in it. What Putin has said is that, of course, we can negotiate. The war could have been over yesterday. The war could have never started uh, if um, Ukraine had acceded to our territorial demands. And that's where we have the real problem that we're dealing with, because if we accede to Russia's territorial demands, if Ukraine is forced to capitulate and give up not just Crimea, which was taken in 2014. Again, we've been in this war for almost 10 years, if you think about it. Uh, and then also now give up the Donetsk uh, and Luhansk regions, the Donbass region and Zaporizhia and Kherson. Think of all the precedents for other conflicts, not just in Europe, but around the world. Remember, Greece and Turkey still have massive disputes in the Aegean. And, you know, we have them in Cyprus, we have them in the Eastern Mediterranean. So what we have to do is have... I agree with, with the way that you're phrasing this. We can't just have it decided on the battlefield, but how we also decide it diplomatically. These things have to be complementary. But if the and if the ground yeah. if the opening position from the West is, you can't have any change of, of border from kind of pre 2014 Ukraine borders. I mean, obviously that's not a realistic. That's not a peace negotiation. That's just a sort of demand for complete surrender. Like, what sort of 
things should we be talking about as an opening position in a peace negotiation? Part of it is Ukraine's defence and ability to defend itself against Russia coming back again. So that has to be part of the equation. But then if there's any kind of territorial settlement, it has to be done in an international frame, in which it's made clear that this can't be a precedent for other countries just taking territory. Because we have Taiwan, we have all of these other areas that we're really worried about doing the same thing. We have Greece and Turkey inside, you know, with all these claims, competing claims on Aegean islands, for example. We have to make sure that Russia does not just simply get a gift of territory uh, that is, you know, basically recognised there without there being an international frame. So we need international territorial agreements. You know, the, the Ukrainians were willing to contemplate at some point Crimea uh, being subject to an internationally supervised referendum 15, you know, 20 or so years down the line. That was before all of the incredible violence and atrocities uh, that we have seen there. So it's going to take some time to get back to that kind of position. There has to be a push to get Russia to negotiate and compromise. And that's what I'm saying is right now, Putin is showing no sign whatsoever of that, that willingness. So we need to have a, a, a mixture of what's going on in the battlefield in diploma diplomacy. There was a moment earlier in the war, wasn't there, where Lavrov was talking about some kind of peace settlement or and it wasn't it, it felt like there was some interest in the Ukrainian administration in talking uh, with him about that and then it was actually western powers like the UK that sort of said don't go down that road we need to have victory that's actually, but... Freddie that's actually not true that's okay. all uh, that's all a kind of a, a basically a russian trolling and you know kind of uh, basically disinformation campaign okay it's it's what is true the truth that there was a it's true that there was a negotiation uh, in sort of February, March, and it was in Istanbul. I mean, I've talked to lots of people who were there and who were around this. There's actually a really good series of articles about this. There's a woman called Sabina Fischer uh, in Germany who's written a long, extensive article about this. And it came up with a preliminary set of, of points, a kind of, you know, the, the, the structure of a negotiation, which would have involved Russia pulling back to pre-February 23rd lines. It would have um, basically left Crimea in Russian hands. And then that was when the, the uh, Ukrainians were willing to discuss, while well, this possibility of a international territorial arrangement and a referendum on Crimea down the line. Now, since then, uh, as you have mentioned, you know the war has gone on. There was all of the atrocities in Buchar and Irpin that became evident. There was no, never any clarity that Putin himself would have accepted this because he wasn't negotiating. There were envoys uh, that were sent to Istanbul, and there's a lot of stories have come out from. Uh, Russia since uh, then that suggests that Putin wasn't necessarily willing to go down that path. He was trying to see what the Ukrainians were willing to do. I've been involved in many negotiations with Russia and you don't get um, you know, very far on your opening gambit because that's when both sides are trying to see what the other is willing to do. It would also have involved um, the Ukraine demilitarizing and becoming neutral. And at this point, you know, obviously, given uh, the intensity of the war, um, that was also a question you know, early on about how Ukraine would be able to uh, basically secure itself. What would there be security guarantees? So we were in the initial phases phases of a negotiation. So what happened next, of course, has pushed that off track, because after that, you've had Russia annexing more territory, talking about the expansion of its borders and basically telling the world, the world had better get used to it. Russia is expanding again. So we've got a real dilemma. We've got an impasse here. We've got to figure out how we basically reconcile all of these things, as you're suggesting here. So you mentioned Putin there, and you mentioned this idea of negotiation. Famously, you sat next to Vladimir Putin on a number of occasions, had dinner with him. Um, you've seen him up close. Um, what is the best way to begin some kind of negotiation? What is the best way, do you think, to attract him into wanting to negotiate? And, and I guess the accompanying question is, does that mean that the Western position is kind of a posture in, a, in that negotiation at the moment? By, by not mentioning any possibilities of any territorial deals, it's sort of to, to, to make sure not to come into any negotiation weaker. Correct. I mean, you've, you've, you've got it. Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, that's kind of when it becomes, you know, very difficult about laying things out because Putin always wants to know what's your move. He's not a chess player per se. I mean, we always use chess as an analogy. I mean, I think we all know that he played judo 
and um, he was actually very proficient at it. He was a, a judo champion, and he's always looking to see what his opponent's um, leverage points may be, what their weaknesses are, where their strengths, what their opening type of move, and what kind of grip they're likely to get. And he plays it over a long period of time. I mean, you excel at judo over tournaments, you know, one bout after another. So you know, it's it's very different from you know, kind of how otherwise you might approach things. And so he's always sizing us up. He's trying to say, are we completely unified here? Are all of these debates uh, leading to a suggestion that we're willing to give up Ukraine? I mean, how much are we willing to give up? How much are we willing to, you know, basically support Ukraine and its fight to roll Russia back again? How far can he go? That's what he's trying to figure out. So he's in it for the long haul, you think, basically? He will? He is absolutely definitely in for it for the long haul. And so, you know, if we had made a decision early on, you know, to basically push Ukraine to give up, you know, obviously Crimea, but possibly also the Donbass in that kind of immediate um, aftermath, Putin would have taken that, pocketed it, and then tried to figure out how much further he could press on. Because that's exactly, you know, how he does it. He would have pocketed that win and then tried to figure out over time, you know, how he could extend it further. Because, again, this started... A long time ago, not just in 2014, but if you think in 2006, Russia cut off gas to Ukraine. Ukraine's been under constant pressure all the way through the 2000s when Putin has come into office. And in 2014, Crimea was taken and there was an attempt to take all of Donbass and, in fact, to take territory all the way down to Odessa, the same territory that the military has been operating in since February of 2022. There were efforts to use covert action and political subversion of the kind that we already saw in Crimea. We've forgotten all of this. There was a whole gambit then to take a whole swathe of uh, territory. So Putin would keep on pushing forward. And so that's what we have to figure out is how to stop it. And that's why our posturing is very important. But I guess the question is, how does that ever end? Because, I mean, I understand the logic of it, obviously, that, you know, we don't want to appear like we're ready to do concessions before he is. But then the sort of logical extension of that is that we just carry on. This could, you know, we must appear strong and united, continue to up the armaments and all of the rest of it. And one year goes by, two years goes by. And anyone who suggests bringing a negotiation or proposing a settlement is then being the weak one who Putin's going to have advantage over. How do we ever start that? Negotiations are never um, just a sign of weakness. That's that's not the way to look at this. The way to look at this is how do you basically create the circumstances for a real negotiation, not a capitulation or um, you know, basically act of surrender? I don't think we're going to have an absolute victory over Russia. I, I mean, I think we, we, we've got to kind of accept this. But look, it only ends when Russians no longer want to extend territory in an imperial fashion. Leadership matters a lot here. So Boris Yeltsin and Mikhail Gorbachev, they didn't have that same way of thinking. I mean, Mikhail Gorbachev made the decision himself to end the Cold War. Boris Yeltsin did not want to reincorporate Ukraine or Belarus or any of the other countries. So you've got to find a formula where Russia no longer wants to extend and expand. So that phrase that we're not going to have an absolute victory over Russia, what does that actually mean then? You mean we're not going to put, push Russia out of all of Ukraine, including Crimea? That, is that what it means? Probably, probably not in the you know, short to medium term but on the battlefield. But one could actually imagine something different over a longer term. Now, look, the, the Baltic states are no longer part of the Soviet Union, are they? They're not part of Russia. They were forcibly reincorporated into Russia, into the Soviet Union, rather, in the 1940s as a result of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and uh, basically uh, Joseph Stalin's aggression against them after they'd been independent you know, for a good uh, 20 years. The Baltic states were independent again, so that didn't you know, last forever. I mean, this was one of the points that Angela Merkel, uh, the former Chancellor of Germany, kept making that, you know, things change over time. If we're accepting that we're not going to acknowledge Russia's possession of Ukrainian territory, we'll find other formulas, you know, for basically pushing back um, against that over time. What would you like us to do differently to what we are doing? I mean, speaking as the West, if you were now the advisor to the American president and or the British prime minister or NATO more generally, what should we be doing differently to what we're doing at the moment in order to bring forward a moment of potential negotiation? We basically have to think differently about this. I mean, it's not going to be just as you're suggesting, or as I think all of us are realising, this is not going to be just settled on the battlefield. This isn't going to be like World War I and World War II with some satisfying armistice peace treaty on you know, an aircraft carrier at a table 
you know, we, we're talking against the backdrop of, you know, really the anniversaries of the Yalta agreements of 1945, in which, you know, we Europe was divided up, uh, you know, basically into two spheres. I mean, that's what Putin wants. And that's not what the rest of Europe wants. We don't want another 1945 like settlement of Europe. So then we have to think about a larger framework. The United Nations reinvigorating some of the multinational institutions. That's I mean, it sounds boring, you know. I mean, it's God, not boring. I don't, what, that yeah. phase wasn't a bored expression. It was just, I guess, a sceptical one. The United Nations feels so out of this and so weak. And Russia has a Security Council vote. And Then Security Council, put that to one side. We need to rethink all of this. What I'm saying is we need to rethink those multinational approaches. The only way this really ends is the rest of the world also accept that this isn't really where they want to go. Because we've, we're worried about China and Taiwan. China has all kinds of territorial disputes, including with India and the Himalayas, with Japan, with Vietnam, and you know all of its uh, neighbours in the uh, South China Seas. You know we've got we have to think about an international precedent here. Russia is the last empire in Europe. It's continuously trying to re-expand its borders here. People say this is great power competition. The United States isn't trying to expand its borders. The United States isn't trying to annex anywhere at this particular juncture. It might have done in the past, but it isn't doing this now. I mean, there'd be China sceptics never... would might think differently about that, I suppose. They might, they might. But that's exactly our problem, because we're justifying what Russia is doing to Ukraine because of our irritation with the United States. The United States shouldn't have invaded Iraq, yes. The United States shouldn't have gone into Afghanistan, yes. Any historian would have said, bad idea, even if you felt it was justified. The United States, you know, does all kinds of things that the rest of the world doesn't like. Does that justify Russia, you know, basically devastating Ukraine? No, it doesn't. Unless, you know, the UK, along with everybody else, wants to live in a world that is only decided by clashes among China, the United States and Russia. So that's kind of your positing, basically. A great power world in which the UK and every other country doesn't matter. And it only matters how China, the United States and Russia you know, basically face off among each and between each other. That's not the world I think that the rest of countries want to live in. It's certainly not the world the Finns, the Swedes, the Danes, the Dutch, the Norwegians and others who are really supporting Ukraine want to live in. And basically the pushback against what's happening in Ukraine, that's why I said there has to be some kind of revitalization of multilateral uh, entities and whether it's not the whole UN but part of it. The UN has played a role that war crimes are looking about what's happening in a Ukraine, on the the grain, the Black Sea grain trade. Or dare I say it, the European Union. I mean, it sounds to me almost like what you're hinting at is there needs to be multilateral, multinational entities that aren't entirely based on the US because it has a compromised reputation now. Well, the obvious one, if we're talking about European security, is the European Union, surely. It doesn't just have to be the European Union. It can be, you know, uh, different formulations. I was meeting with a, a colleague yesterday from the Royal United Services Institute in London, and they've got all kinds of ideas that they're kind of thinking about. Because, of course, the UK is not in the EU now. That's not going to be, you know, sufficient. Norway is not in uh, the European Union. And the Norwegian, you know, military um, uh, posture is very important. In fact, Norway has been very good at, at basically managing their relationships with Russia and actually have a very successful example of managing a territorial dispute with Russia in the Barents Sea. And, and they actually have shared sovereignty over Svalbard. And the Russians are actually still abiding by those international regulations because they weren't just set by Norway, they were done by international treaty. All I'm saying here is that we need to have some fresh thinking. You're right in answer, asking all these questions about is it sufficient to be just thinking about tanks and planes and the battlefield? No, it's not. But we're going to have to be, you know, really thinking long and hard about how we frame an international set of agreements. And it's not just going to be from the United States uh, side or just from uh, Europe. Let me go from the, the, the big to the very specific and I'll fire a couple at you, if I may. Nord Stream 2 pipeline. You've been on at the top table of American security affairs. What is your suspicion or conclusion as to who blew it up. But do you, are you convinced that it was the Russians? Do you think there's a chance that it was the Americans? Where do you stand on that? Well, look, initially, I did think it was the Russians. There was just, you know, so much about the um, whole, um, you know, eruption that it made me kind of think of the kind of sabotage actions that the you know, Soviets undertook during World War II and that Putin's father uh, was actually engaged in during the siege of Leningrad 
He talks all about how his father was part of a destruction battalion going behind enemy lines and getting rid of any infrastructure that the enemy could use. And there was just something about the way that Putin talked about it in his speech that made me think the Russians did this, you know, to sort of teach uh, the West a lesson and to, um, you know, basically signal that a lot of other infrastructure could be imperiled. Now, I'm not so sure. I don't believe it was the United States. And um, I'll just, you know, kind of lay out there, look, if the United States had done that by now, given, you know, the, the way that the United States system works, somebody would have uh, laid claim to this. I mean, you can think about many other um, ep episodes in which it's it's got out. The United States can be a pretty leaky sieve in terms of um, information. Some of my colleagues who have been looking at this think Ukraine could have done it. And, you know, it's not implausible because, you know, they already, um, you know, managed to um, have a pretty um, significant strike on the Kerch Bridge, for example. But I haven't seen any evidence. And I, you know, was was I, I've mentioned, you know, before I've been talking to a lot of your European colleagues. I'm not taking talking about this from my previous intel or other role, but I'm just saying that there's still a lot of questions uh, about this. I do not believe that the United States did it. So do you but believe Ukraine has the capacity? Ukraine. You see, that's why I would initially didn't think that it could be Ukraine because I wasn't sure that they could have had the capacity. Uh, but you know, it's it's possible the Ukraine you know, could have found a way of doing this because we've seen them actually being extre extremely inventive and of doing other things as well. But I just want to make it very clear that I absolutely do not know who uh, carried this out. And I think that we actually, you know, should continue to look at this. And I, you know, I'm certainly uh, ready to concede that my initial suspicion that it was the Russians is wrong. Strange and worrying world where nobody knows who did such a major piece of vandalism. But let us let me ask you one more crunchy question, which is fighter jets. That's the topic now. Paris, London, DC. Zelensky is doing his tour asking for, uh, you know, air assistance in this campaign. Should, should we say yes to that? Look, I think everybody has to sort of think about this um, in the context in which you and I have uh, talked about here. And also I have to remember that between 1939 and 1941, the United uh, Kingdom needed a lot of assistance from the United States. And there was such a big debate in the United States. I mean, if you look back in history about whether the US should help Britain as an ally uh, in the same period of World War II and, you know, to help Britain stave off what were fears at one uh, time of, you know, further um, uh, incursions and attacks by Nazi Germany. So, you know, we've had these kinds of debates before in conflict about, you know, how much one should support a country, you know, defending and where itself. does that lead you to? Well, it leads me to is that we have to kind of think about um, how we're basically calibrating stuff on the battlefield and the diplomacy I was talking about before. And I think you know, if military uh, experts are kind of looking over the long range, it's obvious why the U Ukrainians are asking for this, because, you know, we keep talking about escalation. The Russians are continuously escalating. Russia has escalation dominance or had escalation dominance. And the whole um, point of talking about all of the, this military equipment is to prevent U Russia from having escalation dominance in the hope that that will then push them you know, towards negotiations. Because Putin will only negotiate when he thinks that achieving his current goals is not possible and he needs to come up with a different formula. Now, hope... Does that mean potentially happen. yes, then, to Arab Yes, I would say potentially yes. But I would say it's really then contingent on what you were you know, asking me before about what is our longer term plan to try to get Russia to the negotiating table. Because look, Russia and Putin right now think that they can win this war by brutalizing Ukraine, by destroying Ukraine and by destroying their own population. I mean, Putin is talking about throwing not just the 300,000 people have been drafted, but another 500,000 people. Um, into this campaign, he's willing to sacrifice as many Russians as it takes for this. And so, you know, part of this is the problem of Putin himself, how to constrain him, how to, you know, get the message across to him that he's ruining Russia's future as well, that the relationship with Europe will be irre irrevocably, uh, you know, altered now, that there will be no turning back. This will be a permanent rupture, at least for several generations. Putin still seems to think that he can get away with all of this carnage and brutality, and it'll be back to business as usual. He thinks that's what's happened to Assad in Syria. And the more that we talk about the fact that, well, Russia has all of these rights and privileges and that, you know, we just need to resolve this and please take Ukrainian territory and then we'll all be back to business, the more that he will persist. 
I wouldn't say that's what many people are saying, what you've just... No, I'm not just saying what people are saying. I'm not suggesting you're saying that. I said, look, there are people out there who are saying that, Freddie. I mean, I read it all the time. That they're basically saying, look, if we can get a formula here, we get, you know, Ukraine to give up territory, then Putin will stop. He won't stop unless he basically thinks that Russia's interests are going to be imperiled. And right now, that's not the case for him. I mean, there are still, um, you know, 80-odd countries, 87 countries that allow Russians visa-free... Uh, access of only 30 odd, 34, 35 countries that have imposed sanctions. And, you know, Putin is just replugging the Russian economy, moving from Europe to the Middle East and Asia. Is that not the realization of the last year that the Western power is less than we thought it was? Most countries in the world have not taken a side. The Putin can now pivot to, to China. He has new pieces of infrastructure to replace Western technology and all the rest of it. And it feels almost like we've sort of hastened a division in the world and pushed Russia into a different orbit where maybe there was a should have been a more intelligent way to go about it. Well, there certainly should have been a more intelligent way of going about it. But I mean, I, I don't think that, you know, kind of that then justifies allowing Russia to totally brutalise Ukraine, right? And I don't think that's what you're saying. I think that, you know, what we are seeing is, you know, Russia gambling, OK, we can trash the West talk about existential war here, we're at war with the West, and we can just basically pick up you know, elsewhere and create a new division. What we have to make sure is that that new division doesn't take hold. We're seeing actually Russia become more dependent on China. China and Russia are getting fused together. I don't think that's in anyone's interest. So not in Russia's either, actually, because they become very vulnerable you know, over the time. Russia sits on vast swathes of Chinese territory that it took in 1861 as well. It's not, you know, Russia and China have had their uh, periods of the past of conflict over their border. Russia's longest borders with China. Russia is a, a feature of Asia Pacific security issues as well. Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, there's all these other countries. Singapore, they don't like this either. So what we have to do is kind of work with other countries to, again, make it clear. This is why I go back to, you know, I know we get eye rolls about the United Nations, not the UN Security Council, but the UN General Assembly, other countries, to make it clear that this is unacceptable what Russia is doing. And South Africa is having naval, right as we speak, naval exercises with China and Russia. That's just not on. I mean, we have relationships with South Africa. It's one thing to be neutral and sit on the fence, but it's another to be you know, essentially allowing China and Russia to drill, uh, have drills, naval drills that they can use against, you know, other countries. I mean, South Africa should be called out on that. But we have to then find a way of making it clear what we're standing for here, which is the violation of the UN Charter and international law. When we play democracy versus autocracy or values or this or that, it just doesn't cut it because, you know, the United States and the United Kingdom and France and other, you know, colonial powers, you know, we've got a lot of baggage and people don't buy it. But we have to basically find ways of calling out, you know, Russia for the behavior that it's undertaking and getting that message to stick. And so diplomacy is extraordinarily important. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask you about Donald Trump. You accepted a job within his White House, I, technically a political appointment, I think it was, in 2017. You were there for two years and then you famously uh, testified against him um, in 2020. Do you think, had he still been president, Russia would have invaded? No, probably um, Russia, uh, Putin would have um, anticipated that he could get, you know, Ukraine handed over without the necessity of um, invading. So if you look back to what happened in the run up to the war, there's the Geneva meeting uh, between Biden and Putin. And Putin's hoping at that point, after the you know, shambolic withdrawal from Afghanistan, that basically Biden's willing to cut the losses on Ukraine and on Europe as well. I mean, basically, he's trying to figure out whether Ukraine really matters and is pushing Biden to basically negotiate um, away Ukraine, a bit like Yalta 1945 and Roosevelt and Churchill and Stalin again. And Biden isn't willing to negotiate Ukraine. It's not the United States to negotiate away. Same, you know, on Europe. It's not going to go over the heads of, you know, all the Europeans. And, um, you know, Russia's also given these ultimatums. The United States needs to pull up out of Europe and, you know, take its bases and its missiles and go away and, you know, leave, you know, Russia uh, to its own devices. And 
Biden isn't willing to negotiate on that basis. He's willing to negotiate U.S.-Russian bilateral relationships and basically, you know, nuclear weapons and this kind of issues, the strategic stability debates that Russia and the United States have always had. And on that basis, basically, Putin um, assumes, well, OK, then I've got to use force. And that, you know, he literally says afterwards, well, the United States won't negotiate, so we're invading. And of course, he doesn't think that uh, he'll end up in a massive war. He thinks it's going to be the special military operation over in a week or two weeks because no one will respond. This gets back to where we started about, you know, where we've always gone wrong. We've never signaled that we really care about anything. And so, you know, th- we never said that those post-World War II red lines were, were still in place. You know, here, have some territory. I mean, we allowed Russia to, uh, you know, invade in Uh, Georgia and then, you know, Ukraine later. So what would have happened with Trump is Trump would have likely, you know, kind of basically negotiated. So, I mean, Trump always said Ukraine didn't matter. That's what happened in that first impeachment trial. Uh, Basically, Trump had made it very clear that Ukraine didn't matter to him one little bit, that national security didn't matter. And this was all just about personal favours and Ukraine was just a plaything. And so, you know, the assumption from Putin was or would have been with Trump that he could have, you know, got hold. He would have done it over a handshake and a. a, Well, or or just no, without much of none of this would have been necessary, basically. Now there there is one element, however, that you know Trump was somewhat unpredictable, and if it looked like Trump was being humiliated in some way uh, by Putin, then you know there might have been, you know, some other, you know, more mercurial reaction. You know, if you think about, you know, Trump was the one who actually did shell Syria, um, send missiles over Syria. Where well, you know Obama hadn't done that before under Trump, you know there were the missiles um, given to Ukraine that you know they weren't under Obama. Trump could be you know quite complicated on some of these issues. So I'm wondering, I mean, you your testimony is is well known. You're no fan of Donald Trump, but do you think that unpredictability is part of the reason that there were no major wars during his time as president? Do you, do you think some people say that? And I wonder what your view is. That I- Well, the situation hadn't ripened in that way. Look, I mean, we're talking about events that evolve, right? And Putin probably wasn't ready at that point. The, the timing, the confluence of events wasn't quite right. I mean, for, there are other factors here. It's not just always about the United States. I mean, he saw weakness in the United States for sure. But he saw weakness over a whole period of time. Remember, he intervened uh, with an influence operation that's why I went into government in 2016. I didn't go in there to serve Donald Trump. I went in there to deal with a national security crisis on the basis of things that I'd done before with many of the same people I'd worked with previously. After you know the Russians sent the you know the troll factory, Evgeny Prigozhin and the Internet Research Agency and the GRU, the military intelligence, and all these on an influence operation to basically subvert the U.S. 2016 presidential election. That's a huge. That's a huge deal. And you know that basically. It wasn't that Putin um, was not doing things during that time frame. There were clashes with U.S. special forces and the Wagner Group in Syria in 20, 2018. That's the one and only contemporary firefight between Russian forces and the United States. There were several hundred casualties on the Wagner side. You know, 2018, there is all. People can go back and you know check what happened there. The Russians are assassinating people all the time. The Skripal case, um, but Litvinenko. You know, it's it. The Russians were not not doing things in this time frame. There was all kinds of subversive, coercive activity, uh, cyber attacks continuously. I guess, I guess my question was more about Donald Trump than than Putin on that instance. And you've had knowledge of both of them, but I suppose most journalists would would push you to condemn Trump in in more and more severe terms, and and you've done that. I guess I'm I'm interested in the other side. Uh, having worked with him for that period, what's the best thing? you can say about him. Do, do you think some of his instincts were good? Well, look, I mean, good is a, you know, kind of a, a basically subjective point of view, isn't it? But look, I think he had a lot of instincts um, where he understood strength versus weakness. Um, you know, he understood that he had to, you know, appear strong. He had that kind of strong man you know, idea in many of his interactions with people. Sometimes that was, you know, kind of misplaced uh, in the way that he, you know, kind of behaved. But he also asked a lot of questions, hard questions that we weren't asking ourselves, why we were doing this, why we were doing that. He was right on a number of issues related to European security, honestly. He basically was saying, well, look, if Russia was such a threat, as he said to Germany, why are you involved in all of these multi-billion dollar deals for energy development? Bloody good question, right? Uh, you know, well, what so he was about, right on the, uh, on the pipeline. Yeah, there's that amazing yeah, video. He was, 
he was right on the money on those ones, literally. Basically saying to um, you know countries that are part of NATO, look, if NATO is so concerned about Russia or other threats, why are you not spending enough on your defense? And why are you always looking to the United States? You know, sometimes he would say NATO is 100% dependent on um, uh, the United States. Remember that? I mean, or 80% dependent, which wasn't entirely true. But he also wasn't wrong in the fact, and we've seen that during the war in Ukraine, that United States ended up having to be indispensable in its leadership and military uh, provisions again. So there were lots of things he was, you know, right on China as a, a as a threat as well. Uh, although, you know, often what we saw with Trump was he was somewhat enamored with the strong man on the top because he saw himself reflected in them, be that Putin or President Xi, where he was much more hard on the relationship with the country itself. I mean, he didn't pull back you know, from some of the actions that were taken against Russia behind the scenes, things that nobody really talks about, nobody really saw. And the same with China. But he was you know, pandering often to the strong man on the top because he wanted to have a good relationship with them. So he would often undercut himself. So, But the questions that he asked about things you know, he was asking people to, you know, basically justify why they were continuing in a certain way with a certain policy. And those questions hadn't been asked before in the way that he asked them. Execution was often a problem. There are things where I think he actually deserved more credit uh, than he actually got on North Korea. I mean, again, you know, the way that he talked about things often was somewhat, um, you know, deceptive as well. I mean, obviously, the, the way that he talked with North Korea after the abomination of what happened to Otto Wambia, you know, his kind of cozying up, um, you know, so it seemed with Kim Jong-un. At the same time, he recognised that he was going to have to do something, um, I would say, non-conventional in terms of dealing with a real threat from North Korea that he inherited um, from the Obama administration. I mean, the one thing that Obama told him that really seemed to have sunk in was, you know, we're on the verge of having, you know, kind of North Korea launch a missile at us. And, you know, uh, basically Trump dealt with that head on. I mean, it's not the way that, you know, obviously many people around him would have wanted it to be dealt with head on. That but, was an know, example of yeah, the, the strongman was... trick working. That's right. And a bit of the madman theory as well. You know, he came across you know, pretty effectively um, in that regard. You know, remember there's the whole Henry Kissinger, you know, talking about Nixon, you know, with the madman theory that actually, you know, kind of did sometimes work. And, and Trump instinctively knew how to play that one. You know, so some of those things he actually deserved more credit than than he got for heading things off, because you know part of the problem with Trump, um, which I think everybody knows at this point, is he's it's all about him. So you know when he said he was you know, really supporting U.S. interests, it was as they were reflected by his own sense sense of self interest, and sometimes that would work, and sometimes it was absolutely disastrous. Fiona Hill, we've run out of time. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing your time, and we can see over your shoulder your latest book is available now. Thanks so much, Freddie. I really appreciate it. Thank you. That was Fiona Hill, a senior intelligence analyst in the George W. Bush White House, in the Barack Obama administration, and most famously in the administration of Donald Trump, where she was a political appointee working in the White House with him, saw a lot of things up close and has been the US's advisor on Russia and Ukraine, or one of the top ones for decades. Absolutely fascinating to hear a different perspective from her. I thought quite a nuanced one and one that I wouldn't necessarily have expected, especially when we managed to get her to list the positive aspects of Donald Trump, who she very nearly took down in the impeachment trial of 2020. Thank you for tuning in. This was Unheard.